I'm Gerhard Lazu, and you're listening to Ship It Dot Show, a podcast about ops, infrastructure, and embracing change. This is our ninth Kaizen with Adam and Jared. We start today's conversation with the most important thing embracing change. For me, this means putting Ship It on hold after this episode. It also means making more time to experiment, maybe try a few of those small bets that we recently talked about with Daniel. Kaizen will continue. We are thinking on the changelog. Stick around to hear the rest. Big thanks to our partners Fastly and Fly. This MP3 is served with minimal latency from the Fastly Edge location, which is closest to you. Our app and database run on fly.io because it keeps things simple. Change is constant. And the one thing, the one lesson which really helped me was to not fight it, but embrace it. Some may think, oh, this sounds very agile-ish, and I thought we I thought we are post-agile. But this is one constant, right? Change will always happen. And if anyone has been paying attention to the world, things have changed so many times in the last couple of years. So that's the one thing that will always be constant change. So With that in mind, me embracing change and change being constant, I'll be taking a break from Ship It after this episode. Oh, that's a gut punch. It is a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I want to make it sound as positive as it can be because it is. So if you remember when we started, I was experimenting so much and trying so many things, crazy ideas like let's use Kubernetes for changelog. Remember I that do one? Recall. I do. <laughs> For sure. Mm-hmm. And then Jared came, no, let's use Fly. And we try that as well. So we were experimenting quite a lot before Ship It, or I was experimenting quite a lot before Ship It. And then, you know, Ship It was taking more and more of my time to the point that I was rushing from one thing to another thing, to the next episode, the next episode. And um, I had less time to experiment. So I'd like to do more of that. More experimenting, less shipping. Of ship it less shipping of ship it episodes yes <laughs> that's right but more but sh- definitely shipping so things will still continue changing for on the change log side uh the improvements will not stop and if anything a couple of other areas are already picking up like dagger for example for me which means i need more of my headspace more of my a game mm-hmm. for that thing embracing the change so the big why, if we say why in general, it's because you were stretched too thin in order to do the experimentations that you love and you need some headspace. Dagger taking off, taking over, and ship it being very much your passion project, a side project for you. You know, had some financial stability, but you know, was never going to be, or at least in its current form, not going to be a full time thing. And Something had to give because you were burning. You're burning on both ends and we don't want you to burn out. And so there you have it. That's right. I was checking myself basically. And uh, it's really important to know when to stop and what to stop and to know how to rearrange things. And everything is temporary. I think that's something that, you know, it's worth emphasizing. Nothing will last forever, not even us. Right. But hopefully we've had some great time together. More amazing things will come because this is not the end of it. It's just a pause and we don't know how it will continue and what shape or form. I don't think that the approach, nothing wrong with the approach, Mm -hmm. but we can improve on it some more. Some video would be nice. There are so many videos that we shot in the last two years since we had to ship it, but we published very few of those, like working with various people, experimenting, uh, but we never had time. You know, I remember episode 33, Mary Shipness. We recorded with uh, with the Upbound folks. We recorded with the Dagger folks at the time, right? Because I wasn't part of Dagger back then. And the third thing was Parka. We were profiling our app and everything was running in Kubernetes at the time to understand where the CPU time is spent. 
And Parka improved so much since, but we haven't installed it in the, in the new world, which for us is Fly.io. So that's maybe one thing worth bringing back. I don't know. We'll see. But I know that we have many more ideas of things to improve. So small bets, more small bets, more trying things out and see what sticks and embracing change. So this is episode 90. So you made it to 90 episodes before this hiatus, this pause. So congrats on 90 episodes. Most podcasts do not make it that far even. Unfortunately, not 100, which would have been a, a coup de gras, would have been perfect. However, if it would have been 100, it would have felt more like the end. And this is not the end, right? So 90, like who stops at 90? Obviously, something else is going to come after 90. You know, it's okay. not a natural place to stop. 100 would be like, that's it. The book is done. Right. We would uh, call it a grand finale and we would you'd sail off into the sunset. Well, uh, for me, I, I'm a little, of course, embrace the change. I'm a little bit sad. I know we have a lot of listeners who truly love this show. It's a unique show in our catalog and change laws catalog. You talk about things that we don't talk about elsewhere in ways that we can't talk about. And so, of course, we will miss it. For me, selfishly, perhaps my favorite episodes are divisible by 10 uh, I like the Kaizens maybe because I get to listen to myself. No, that's just a joke. I just enjoy catching up with you. And, Not a joke. <laughs> no, I do like it. I'm starting to like it. You have, you have a nice voice, Jared. That's what it is. <laughs> Let's be honest. It's not how I say it. It's how I say it. No, I'm just it's how no, you I'm hear really it. joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my voice that's great. It's the things I'm saying that's the best. Just kidding. But... I love our Kaizens. If the interviews never came back, I could get over it. If the Kaizens never continued, I don't think I could get over it. So uh, we don't know exactly what's coming next, but I think Kaizen needs to continue to be a thing that exists in our world. And we don't know what form that's going to take. Maybe it'll be on the changelog. Maybe it'll be on some show that doesn't exist yet. Maybe it'll just be a show called Kaizen. I don't know, but we don't want to lose you entirely, Gerhard. We want you to continue to experiment push forward our operations here, our, our platform, pushing us into new things so we can learn along the way and sharing that at least the navel gazing part of mm -hmm. Shibit. What do you think? I love it. Yeah. If you remember, one of the ideas for the show titles before Shipit was Kaizen. Right. That's how like, it's like so embedded within me. I mean, I, I never see myself stop doing that. And the fact that we can talk about it, I think it's great. The cadence makes sense. It fits with everything. Right. And in fact, your idea for to us, your pitch for this show, was basically just the Kaizen stuff. And I said, nobody wants to listen to us every week talk about <laughs> our platform yeah. every week. We need to mix in some interviews. And so that became Ship It. It was the interview shows. And then I thought you picked a pretty good cadence of every 10, every two and a half months, almost quarterly, but you know, using the episode numbers brilliantly to map out a Kaizen episode that made sense. I think if we would have done, if we would have came out and done a weekly Kaizen with us three, I don't think it'd be the show that it has been. And so I think that was a good collaboration by us to to realize that, but also you were definitely onto something uh, in terms of just an enjoyable format that people do like to follow and say, these crazy guys just air their dirty infrastructure laundry right here on the air yeah. for us to learn from. And I think that's, I think that's cool. Yeah. I think so too. And I really like the new GitHub discussions. I mean, we had the one for Kaizen 8. Now we have 440, which is a discussion for Kaizen 9, which is this episode. And it captures all the things. I think that works really, really well. You have the written format, you have it in GitHub, you have pull requests, issues, all things connected. I think it's uh, something worth celebrating. And while we don't ship once every two and a half months, because that would be crazy, we do talk about the highlights. And I think that is a nice forcing function to always keep moving forward, always keep improving. It keeps reminding us of what we've accomplished. Adam, you want to chime in here? You've been uh, nodding along, but you haven't. Yeah, I was, uh, I think you know, it's too sad. I, think I am a little thing. too sad, honestly. I was, I was having <laughs> trouble coming up with words because, you know, ending is always challenging. I guess pausing is a little easier. But, um, you know, it's bittersweet for me because there's, there's a lot of like about it, obviously, and there's a lot that... Uh, that came from our deeper relationship and uh, everything. But I'm always, uh, I'm also about, you know, quitting when it makes sense. You know, the, the dip from Seth Godin was, you know, by far one of my favorite books 
you know, in terms of like self development. And that is like, uh, that book isn't really about quitting necessarily. I guess it might be. It's about knowing the right time to quit, I suppose, you know, or pause even something. And that's a challenge because too often we'll push ourselves beyond our limits and things break. Sometimes those things that break are really important to us and that's called regret, you know? And so none of us want to live with regret. I don't want you to live with regret. I want to do great things together, but not at the expense of the things that are important to you and to us. And I think from a listenership, you know, I would love the listeners come to this and, and say, that's really awesome to like know when to pause. I mean, for a while there, I had to pause Founders Talk and other things that were way back in the day to make sure that we can focus on the Change All podcast. A couple years back, Marielle and I paused Brain Science because like it was just too fast of a clip for us. We were both really busy. We're still in the midst of, of uh, bringing that show back, but we have great ambition and great plans. But, you know, you have to look at what you're capable of and what you want to achieve and kind of pair the two up, you know, and say, is this sustainable? And if it's not, you know, be wise and, and put your no down because too often do we say yes when we should, should say no. 100%. On the note of more video stuff, though, and this, this you know, experimentation and this Kaizen and, and some of it, it sounds like what we really wanted from this was the experimentation and the freedom and then, you know, the cadence of the actual podcast, which I agree, a weekly podcast is incredibly hard to do. If you're listening to this right now, anybody who's shipping a show weekly for years, they're not quite superheroes, but they're, they're darn close because it takes a lot to show up every single week and, sh and do something that is worthwhile. And if you have a growing audience like we've had, you know, and this show has been part of that and that's a, a big, big challenge. However, e even like on today's topic, like DHH and cloud, that, that conversation's out there, like this backlash against the cloud. Like I would have loved if that show was great, by the way, I love that episode, but like in terms of experimentation and videos on, on YouTube, I would love to see like, because you don't have to have like a, a, a rhythm. You can just do it when you want a deep dive or a, a peek behind the veil of their non-cloud cloud, you know, their, their own infra. Like what does that mean to stand up your own infrastructure and like just have a 20 minute DHH screen share with you and you guys just like hammered out for like 20 minutes. That'd be cool for me every couple of months, you know, like nothing that's weekly, just something that's like, show me behind the screen, you know, that, show me behind, give me a peek. At your infra, you know, what were your choices? Why'd you make them? How does it work? Et cetera. That'd be cool to me. And with no, with no necessary cadence, just like whenever it makes sense. And that kind of fits into your desire to explore because you're an explorer, Gerhard, you know, you like to push the boundaries and be on the edge. But I think this show may have limited you from doing that potentially. Adam, you just said behind the screen. Was that a slip of the tongue? Or are you workshopping a new, a new title <laughs> scheme? You know, always Jared, always. I like where this is going. <laughs> Behind the keyboard. Was that on purpose? Or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Behind. Not away from the keyboard. Behind the keyboard, behind the screen, behind the camera. There you go. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the big news. That's probably a surprise to most, if not all. In terms of Ship It subscribers, so a lot of these people are like, they listen to Ship It every week and they just heard this and like, well, that sucks for me. Touch points, like we're talking about potential experimentation. How can they stay plugged in with you, what you're doing, and maybe with the future of the show? Obviously, don't don't unsubscribe from your feed reader unless you're a super clean freak because there might be new things getting published into the feed. You'll just go ahead and let it go inactive. And if we ever publish here again, you'll just automatically get them. So I'll say that much myself. Uh, subscribe to the change log probably would be a good idea. But I'll, I'll just throw that in there as a as a shameless self-promotion. But for you, Gerhard, like how can people who want to stay connected with you personally beyond ship it, where should they go? Yeah. So I'm still on Twitter. It's still a thing. I'm on changelog social, even though I haven't tweeted anything yet, if that's a thing. Tooted. I haven't tooted. There you go. Sorry. You See? There. See, I'm not up to date <laughs> on all these things. So I think that's an area <laughs> worth improving. No one wants to be up to date with that word. Yeah. I'm still very much on the changelog Slack, on the changelog GitHub. That's where I intend to spend more time since this whole Kaizen thing behind the scenes for ChangeLog is not going to stop. We'll still be improving things. There's pull requests, there's issues, there's all sorts of things happening there, maybe even discussions. I mean, we had this second GitHub discussion 
where everyone is uh, welcome to participate, where we're talking specifically about what we are going to improve about Changelog. So I'm not sure how Chris Eggert ah. knew how to jump in and, and help out and do that improvement, or Jarvis Yang, and there's a couple of others, or Noah, how Noah Betson knew how to do this and a couple of others. But uh, this is still going on. We are still on GitHub. We're still doing things. We're still on Slack, on the Changelog Slack. So we're still there. It's just like the show, mm -hmm. the cadence, the weekly cadence. We are pausing that until we figure out, or I figure out what comes next, which would be still like with listeners, with, you know, people as like, I really like Adam's idea. It's closer to, you know, what I had in mind a couple of years back. And I'm craving for experimenting more and only putting an episode out there, maybe in a different format when it's ready. Now, it doesn't mean once a year, but it means less than once a week. So between once a week and once a year, <laughs> that's somewhere the sweet spot, which I'm yet to discover. Mm -hmm. There you go. So not continuous delivery, but some sort of delivery. Not of episodes, <laughs> because there's so many other things, right? <laughs> I mean, it has to be meaningful. It has to have like, I remember, for example, the Merry Shipments, episode 33. That took a lot of early mornings, late nights, and weekends. I have no idea how I could make time at that point for it. It was crazy. I no longer have that time now, which means that I no longer can do those things, which means that it's all in the episodes and the few hours here and there, which is just not making me happy. Anyways, right. we are improving that. It might make sense to say how we got here, which I think if you listen to the show since the beginning, you know kind of how we got here. But how we got here originally was like you, Gerhard, was our SRE for hire, essentially. You helped us stand up our infrastructure way back in 2016 when that's correct uh, when Jared was exploring you know delivering and deploying an extra application to production and just I, I I'm a paraphrasing the story of course but like how we got here was by shipping and we would talk about that once a year on the change law podcast we like doing that so much we're essentially just regressing back to the original <laughs> blueprint essentially right not once a year though more than once a year well maybe less than once a year but back to the blueprint of like you know, you're still working with us on our infrastructure. That's not changing. We're going to still keep improving that. That's not changing. We'll keep developing partnerships. One of the ones we just formed recently was TypeSense behind the scenes. Jared and Jason Bosco are like hammering out some cool stuff with TypeSense uh, for our search. And that's so cool. But like these things are going to keep continuing. We're just going to pause the podcast, essentially. The the extra is changing. And we're regressing back to the, the normality, essentially. The opportunity to put your Explorer hat back on put a smile back in your face and leverage your time so wisely. Exactly. That's exactly right. And in a way, we are kind of going back to the beginning from the shipping side of things because we have a huge improvement that went out in the last two and a half months. And there's even more amazing stuff coming out in the next two and a half months so until like the next Kaizen in the time period. And it means that I will have more time to do a better job of that, focus more, do more. And obviously that means for me, CI, CD as code. So we are going back to the initial idea of like, hey, how do we get changelog out there? How do we use, for example, in, in, in back in the days, it was Docker. We're deploying on Docker Swarm, running on Linode, set up with Terraform. Or was it Ansible? I think it was Ansible. It was Ansible and Concourse CI. There you go, Concourse CI, exactly. So in a way we are back there, right? It's the continuation of Concourse CI, it's the continuation of that. Uh, there is a PaaS now, which is Fly, but again, it's, it's going to be a lot more. Integration with services, and I know that Jared is missing certain things, you know, and stuff is coming, but for that, we need more time. Friends, this is Jared here to tell you about Changelog++. Over the years, many of our most diehard listeners have asked us for ways they can support our work here at Changelog. We didn't have an answer for them for a long time, but finally, we created Changelog++, a membership you can join to directly support our work. As a thank you, we save you some time with an ad-free feed, sprinkle in bonuses like extended episodes, 
and give you first access to the new stuff we dream up. Learn all about it at changelog.com slash plus plus. You'll also find the link in your chapter data and show notes. Once again, that's changelog.com slash plus plus. Check it out. We'd love to have you with us. So describe to us this big update, this big improvement that you did over the last two and a half months. I think we touched on it in Kaizen 8, but it wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was a Dagger version 0.3, I believe. Uh, First of all, explain what the improvement is, and then you can get into like what you had to do to pull this off and where it's going from there. So Mary Shipmas, I keep coming back to that episode 33, we introduced Dagger in the context of changelog. What that meant is that we were migrating from uh, CircleCI to GitHub Actions. Rather than trading one YAML for another YAML, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had CI running locally first and remotely next? And remotely would be via a very thin interface. That interface was Dagger. You can run it locally. You run it in whatever CI you have, invoking the same command, and the same things will happen because your CI now runs in containers. I don't mean CI, like the actual operations. That was November 2021. Beginning of 2022, I joined Dagger. We did a lot of improvements. And end of last year, which was just a few months ago, we released SDKs, which means that you can write your CI, CD system, your pipelines in code. Whether it's Python, whether it's Go, whether it's Node.js, It's no more YAML. It's no more weird things, weird configuration languages that some perceive weird. It's the code that you know and love. So what that means is that now you can write proper code that declares your pipeline that does like all the things. And I say declares because it's lots of function calls. What's of like lazy chaining, which eventually gets translated into a DAG, hence Dagger, the name. And then everything gets materialized behind the scenes. Some things are cached naturally, others things aren't. So what that means that right now we are in a phase where from Dagger 0.1, which is using Q, we now have Go in our code base. And I want to know, how do you feel about that, Jared? How do you feel about having your Elixir (laughs) spoiled, hopefully not, by some Go code? No, I mean, I feel good about it. I feel like a, a renaissance man. You know, we have we have all these different things. We, we taste of the best elixirs, and we also can just pull in some go when we want to. I mean, that's that's diversity. That's inclusion. I'm happy about it. That's amazing. So no more YAML. <laughs> no more <laughs> Also happy Q. about that. <laughs> no more Q. No more make files. I was going to learn Q. I don't have to learn Q now. Exactly. It's all like you have to learn go. No more make files, zero make files. <laughs> yep. Now you got me. Yeah, the top one went and the others will, will disappear as well from the subdirectories when we finish the migration. So there's no more top make file. Okay, so where do I go? I, I look for a .go file, it's in there somewhere to look at what's going on. So it's uh, everything everything Dagger related is in mage files. Okay, and mage is Go's version of make or rake or like a task runner thing? It's just like to invoke things and just to have like different entry points. So for example, right now we have three entry points. The first entry point is the uh, Dagger version 0.1 legacy, where we can run the old pipeline 0.1 and 0.3. That was one PR. That was PR. So we had PR 446, where we run zero, uh, the pipeline 0.1, Dagger 0.1 pipeline, the Q1, in 0.3 using the Go SDK. So the entry point is Dagger v- version 0.1, colon, ship it. And that wraps the old pipeline. There's also a new, again, this is like mage, so it, it exposes, I mean, you can think of those like subcommands. okay? It all bundles up in a binary and, you know, it has like different subcommands. And if you don't provide any command, it'll show you, hey, you can run these things. That's if in, in essence what it is. So we have image is a namespace runtime. So we can now build the runtime image using Dagger version 0.3. Not only build it, but also publish it to GHCR and that is pull request 450. So now we are building and publishing the changelog runtime image to GitHub Actions, sorry, using GitHub Actions, or within GitHub Actions using a very thin dagger layer. And all it does is basically does go run. Go run the main go file, and the command is image runtime, and off it goes. 
to GHCR. So if you go to ghcr.io forward slash the changelog forward slash changelog dash runtime, you will see our image in all its beauty. What does that mean? It has a very nice description. We are making use of certain labels that uh, the open container spec has. So there's like a sp specific label to show the description in GHCR. So GHCR, that's GitHub's deal, right? That's their registry. GitHub's container registry. That's it. Okay. I haven't used this before, so I'm mm -hmm. I'm a noob here. I'm used to Docker Hub. So this is like GitHub's version. Exactly. Oh, I'm looking at this change log runtime. It has emoji next to it. How beautiful is that? <laughs> <laughs> you already got some emoji in there. So you're already talking my language. Elixir version 1.14.2. So you see the description. I mean, you can see the version that we use in the actual tag. And that's what we're using in production right now. That went out this weekend. Okay. So we're using that runtime image. Okay. And this was built via Dagger inside GitHub Actions. Am I? That's right. Yep. Okay. And you can also run it locally if you want. Inside, do, when you run it locally, are you running it inside Dagger? How do you, what's the terminology here? Okay. So you're running it. So it, it runs Go on the outside. It provisions a Dagger engine inside Docker. Because if you have Docker, I mean, it needs to provision like the, the brains, if you wish, of where things will run. So by default, if you have Docker, it knows how to provision itself. When the Dagger engine spins up, all the operations run inside Dagger engine. The really cool thing is, if anything has been cached, it won't run it again. So imagine our image, right? When we pull down our image. So when we build this runtime image, we have, uh, obviously, we have to pull down the base one, which is based on the hex PM image, and that's from Docker Hub. Then it needs to install like a bunch of dependencies. And by the way, all that stuff, I mean, if you look at, okay, I have to show you the code. This is too cool, Jared. <laughs> Check this out. So if you go to the pull request 450, okay? And if you look at um, mage files, image, image.go, look at line 50 to 61. Build.elixir dot with add packages dot with git with image magic. So this is like a chain of function calls that you've, named nicely that's it and you can mix and match them in whichever way you want so when we for example we convert the rest of our pipeline to dagger 0.3 we'll do build we'll take elixir with app packages and whatever else we want and when we want to publish the image we can chain again the function calls however we want for example we do not want with node.js when we publish our image but we do want with Node.js when we build or compile our assets. So this way we can chain all the functions, get all the bits from the various containers, various layers, assemble it, and make sure that all dependencies will be the same. Because with Node.js knows exactly which Node.js version we do, and it doesn't matter where you call it from. And because of the operations they're cached, they won't rerun. Some of these can take a really long time, by the way. Anyways, I'm super excited about this. So this is, uh, and by the way, Noah, if you're listening to this, uh, I'm very curious to know how much easier it is to bump our dependencies with the new approach. I was just going to ask that because I'm looking at line 16, it says Elixir version equals, and then there's a string 1.14.2. That's it. Can I just change that string? That's it. And that's it? That's it. Change the string, commit and push, and the CI will take care of the rest. Woo! That's now it. we're talking. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> I've asked you for this for years. <laughs> like, Can I go to one place in the code and just change the version and then it'll be done? That's it. Okay. And there's like more and more stuff that we can add on top of that. For example, we can change the local files. You know, like there's like we still have like in contribute MD. There's like if you go to that, by the way, that was updated as well to, to tell you how you change things. So that was updated to make uh, use of like the, of the new, to, sorry, to reference like the new files. Those steps, we can start removing them because we can automate more and more of that stuff. So we can, for example, go and update the Elixir version in the README, in the contribute MD, wherever we have it. It's all code at the end of the day. And it's not scripting. Meaning it's only in the README? Like you could have it in the README only? Meaning that it will only be in the image go. That's it. When you bump it to the image go and the pipeline runs, it will update all the other places. Oh, it'll update the README for you. Exactly. I was going to say, it'd be, it'd be crazy if you actually just had that version in the README and it read it in the image Go, which you probably could do because it's Go code. It could do that. Yeah, it could do that. And it doesn't sound smart, but it just would be interesting. Yeah, no. You want it in code. <laughs> yeah, you want it in code. 
<laughs> yeah. And not to mention that when it's in code, by the way, we can have, again, it's we still need to figure this part out, I suppose, but we could have things that automatically bump it. When a new version comes out, it bumps it in code, the pipeline bumps it everywhere, and because the pipeline runs, it checks if the new version works. And then opens up a PR, if, and then we can just merge. Ugh. That's it, Jared. That's it. That's it. Okay. See, it's, it's stuff like this that gets me really excited. <laughs> You're getting me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's cool. How does that play into the other thing which happened recently? Well, thanks to Chris Eggert. And we, by the way, by the time this episode goes out, we will have shipped an episode of the changelog with Bridget Murtaugh from the Dev Container Spec, from the VS Code team, talking all about this, in which Chris gets multiple shout outs. So he's probably getting sick of hearing us talk about him at this point. He opened up a pull request allowing us to run our code base on code spaces by adding a dev container.json. So thanks to him for that. He's using a Docker compose file and a little bit of JSON. And you can just like say open in code spaces and it's super cool. How do these changes affect his work, if at all, or what's the integration there? Because now we have like a dev environment. We have this image that you're changing the way it works. Yeah. It all builds on top of it. This is brilliant. So this is brilliant. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and it's not me. It's the combination of people that came together, right? I wasn't expecting Chris, you know, to come along and, and nobody and was. Add this. That was like great. It was amazing. So based on that, I was that was pull request 437 in our code base. I did a follow-up 449, which basically changes the reference in the dev container with our runtime image that is now pulled from GHCR. And because you're running GitHub code spaces, that will be very fast, much faster than if you pull it from any other registry. So that was another reason to go to GHCR. So that works currently? That's how it works currently. If you go and open the file, come on, let's let's check it out. Because I just did it last week in preparation for that conversation with Bridget. And one thing I noticed is pulling from Docker Hub, just the entire, the first run code spaces experience. I mean, it's probably five to seven minutes, uh, you know. That has improved. The, the pull request that I mentioned, 449, it no longer builds it. It references the already built runtime image. If you check out in the dev containers directory, if you look at the Docker compose file, line five now has the image reference. So the runtime image is no longer built. The runtime image reference is pulled. So it shouldn't take six, seven minutes anymore. It should be instant. I'm going to try that again. There you go. You let me know how well it works. And if not, we'll work on it some more. And all this stuff, all these things, we can start templating, right? Once we get it like in the pipeline, there will be a single place where we declare those versions. As soon as the image builds successfully, and because you know we like we go through the process in the pipeline, we can start modifying all these other places, then build the production image, try and deploy it. And if it works, we're done. Merge the PR, we're good. Mm. Who else is doing it like this? How state of the art is this? I don't know. I would say it's pretty cutting edge because we are we are really finding the CI CD with Dagger. We really are. I mean, it's CI CD as code, forget like any weird languages. And some of the stuff that we have coming, I mean I can't talk about all, all the things, but I like I'm like six months ahead and I'm so excited to be there. And I'm so excited. Like, for example, last Friday, it was just a few days ago, we shipped services support. It's an experimental feature. If you're listening to this, you're not supposed to use it, so please don't, okay? Because it may be broken in a number of ways, we don't know. But ChangeLog will be the first one to use the services support in Dagger. What that means is that we will be spinning up a PostgreSQL container that we need for our tests inside Dagger, inside the Dagger engine, because it now has a runtime. And what are the ramifications of that? Well, you spin up containers in code. Just as you write your code, right? Like you can say, spin me up a PostgreSQL container and when it's spun up, connect it to this other container where the test will run. You can have the waiting. I mean, we used to do NC, netcat for heaven's sake, to wait for the PostgreSQL container to be available. There's like services support, there's like ugly YAML, all sorts of weird things. Let's not knock on netcat, Gerhard, come on. Sweet tool. No, it's amazing. I love it. It is old school. It's amazing. <laughs> but what's not amazing is that you have to, you're forced to combine scripting and YAML. To wait. Yeah, you're waiting for a service to be ready for you. In a weird way, exactly. Rather than doing it in code. Why wouldn't you do all these things in code? Because now you can start orchestrating containers. But orchestrating for the purpose of CI CD. Let's be clear about that. 
So we're going to be like a poster child for dagger, aren't we? I mean, these, these people have to love us. We're like using all the bleeding. I mean, by these people, I, I love mean, you. You, you people. I'm dagger. <laughs> I know you are. That's cool, man. I love that. We're, uh, yeah, we're a test bed for cool new things. And we're definitely right there on the edge. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much bleeding we're going to do. We are defining it. Well, we'll find out. And by the way, you have the right person to fix it. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> right? Isn't that the whole point? Yes. All right. Cool. Exciting times. I've always wanted to have one string in my code base in which I could update the version of Elixir. It's there. And then docs too. That's so cool. Like if you update it in like updating docs is a cool thing. Like stale docs suck, especially a Reby. Like when you go to the Reby, it's like, I've gone there recently with other things I'm working on. It's like, it's referencing the old uh, release, for example, in the readme. It says in the installation instructions, which you go to immediately, but it's referencing an old, old release. But if you go to the releases, there's like two new ones, for example. Mm. But the, the, the documentation is out of date. It could always be updated. Not anymore. So is every, so because we do basically, you know, master branch based deploying is every push to master a release effectively yeah that has not changed in years since i've been around that hasn't changed <laughs> right what about on prs and, and branches how does that work we don't deploy so we now run tests by the way we didn't used to run tests in pull requests oh damn it i don't know how i like overlooked that thing that's we just closed them out yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so that was like one thing that that was actually one of the first thing pull request 436 so since pull request 436, which by the way happened in the same Kaizen, since Kaizen 8, we are now running tests uh, for, for every pull request. And we do that by basically leveraging the built-in Docker engine in GitHub Actions, which is a bit slow and you know it doesn't have any caching. But it means that we are running all the pipelines, including building our runtime image, but not publishing it because there, there aren't credentials to do that with every pull request. So while we don't deploy on every pull request, we could. Which would give us like deployment previews effectively. We absolutely could. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And the nice thing would be, I think I'm very keen to try and do that in Dagger. The reason why I'm keen to do that is because of the services support. I'm pretty sure when they were designed, no one thought about this, but we can have longer running environments. So basically have a CI, there's like one action which won't stop until you're okay with it. So how do we figure out routing? I don't know, I'm really, I'm really keen to explore that. We could run a very lightweight version of the changelog in the context of the CI CD, in, con in the context of the pull request, because it doesn't have to serve a lot of traffic. It doesn't need to be anything big. You don't have to, like, the CI CD is already there. You have a VM where you're running the actual code for your tests. So why wouldn't you run a longer running process that exposes changelog. You're blowing my mind, Gerhard. I'm not even... That's a crazy idea, right? No one has thought about that before. <laughs> All right. All right. See, I told you six months from now, <laughs> it's the future. Okay. So... Well, that, that's exciting. When a pull request opens, basically, the, the GitHub runner that runs all the various checks, one of them, we basically, we don't... I mean, we keep it running for longer or we don't even use GitHub runners at that point. So one of the things where which we run, we spin up a change log, a preview one, maybe, and we still need to figure out the data part that will be accessible publicly. We get a random URL that you can hit, and then you can connect to that instance. And that instance runs within one of the CI workers. When the pull request is merged, I mean, one of the checks, again, I still need to figure out how to do this, but one of the checks basically we will not finish until the pull request is merged. And that check in GitHub Actions, that's the one where you can access the changelog, the, the preview version. Nice. So you're literally, you're running a preview in CI/CD. I'm going to need a new diagram. <laughs> Infrastructure MD is the place to get our repo to see how everything wires together. And that's the one that I intend to update as we will have this new stuff. So Infrastructure MD is fairly accurate right now. I think the only thing missing is GHCR. And the reason why it's missing is because I'm migrating the rest of the stuff to GHCR. And once that will complete, it'll be weird to see both Docker Hub and GHCR. So we're in a transition period. Once the dust settles, the diagram will be up to date. But again, that's the only thing which is missing. Everything else is accurate. Fly, uh, Honeycomb, Sentry, everything. Mm -hmm. 
Very cool. Very cool. So what about you, Jared? I know that you've had some improvements in mind. Some of them I think you've already done since Kaizen 8. Yes. Mm, which one do you want to talk about? There's many. I can tell you that. So a lot of my time, Gerhard, as you know, has been spent on rotating all of our secrets. First oh of all. Oh my goodness me. There were so <laughs> many. <laughs> So last pass, uh, thanks for nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, thanks for a few good years. And then we've lost confidence. So we are one password users as a team now, which we talked about for a few Kaizens mm -hmm. and finally made that migration. And then we decided because of the last pass leak and the fact that we're on one password now, it's like great time to just go through and do a key rotation, right? Just rotate all of the things, which was, just a lot of things like, man, we got a lot of secrets in there, lots of integrations and mostly harmless. There's a few fallouts as there tends to be with just that many changes, things that went wrong because of that. The biggest one was our stat system went down for a few days because AWS credentials mm. existed in one place correctly, but the other place incorrectly, I think. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, changelog nightly actually stopped sending because I didn't update the campaign monitor API key on nightly, which mm -hmm. is an old digital ocean box from way back, still just runs dutifully every night on a digital ocean box. So I updated our campaign monitor API key inside of our app and in campaign monitor, but I didn't rotate it over on the other server. And so it failed to send. It was still generating the emails, just not sending them, which mm. is key. You know, that's a key part of it. So there's like a few nights where Nightly didn't go out until I realized it. And then I was like, oh, that one makes total sense. Um, you and I also teamed up on a few things. Oh, yeah. Which is always fun. Issue 442 for anyone that wants to see all the things we had to go through. We had 79 tasks to complete. And some of them were quick, but just like untangling all that, we cleaned up a lot of stuff. And again, it was like almost like a spring clean, even though it was January. It was definitely a spring clean for secrets. Yeah, you don't realize just how many service integrations you have until you go to rotate all your secrets. And then it's like, holy cow, Slack, Campaign Monitor, GitHub, Fastly, AWS, GitHub. Notion. Mastodon. Yeah, GitHub twice, by the way. You said GitHub twice because GitHub is used twice. <laughs> so you have API token <laughs> and a client secret. So yeah, we actually... Same yeah. thing with Slack. There's like two different Slack APIs that we use. Yep. One's for the invites, which is like this old legacy thing that is, was never an official API, how you actually generate an invite. And then everything else is like for Logbot, which is our Slack bot that does a few things. Yeah, there's just so many of them. And then it's like... It's just an arduous process. So uh, this is why my personal private key is, is years old at this at this point, embarrassingly so. We have to roll it again. You won't be able to SSH into things, good things. You don't need to SSH anymore. Isn't, isn't that a relief? That is nice. We're getting better on that front. Yeah. Fly CTL SSH console. I do enjoy that, yes. Mm -hmm. So that was one big piece of work. The other thing, Adam, you mentioned it, it's, it's in flight right now, is we're swapping out Algolia for TypeSense, which is a very cool uh, C++-based search index, search engine, open source um, that we had on the changelog. Jason Bosco had him on the changelog last year. Really liked the guy, got really interested in the product. Algolia has been kind of, we were on the Algolia, we still are on the Algolia open source plan, which sets us at a, at a limit. And so we've hit that limit and we've been putting new things into the Algolia index ever since, but it won't search them until we upgrade our plan. So we're happy to be replacing Algolia with TypeSense. Of course, that's an open source thing, but we're working on a partnership with Jason and his team so that we'll be using TypeSense Cloud. All that's very close to at least being swap out ready. And then we're going to build from there and start to use some of the things that make TypeSense interesting. So I've been coding that. And then the, the third thing is trying to rejigger the way that our feeds are generated and cached and stored in order to get to this clustered world of multiple nodes running the apps without having to change the way we use 
Erlang's built-in caching system because I've just had some issues with that. And I just started thinking, why are we caching stuff if we have a very fast application that can just run close to the user? Let's just figure out a way not to cache stuff as much. Mm. But we have these very expensive you know, pages, specifically the feeds, master feed, changelog feed. I mean, the XML that gets generated is like 2.3 megabytes. You know, it's not going to be fast on any system unless it's literally pre-computed. So I started thinking about different ways of pre-computing and storing files on S3 and fronting that. And there's just lots of concerns with like publishing immediately. We like, we like to publish fast. And we even had a problem, uh, thanks to a listener who pointed it out, with our Overcast ping. Because Overcast, as a specific app, allows you to ping it immediately on publish. And they'll just push notify and like people will get their things immediately, which some people really like that. I'm always surprised there's some listeners who listen like right when it drops. And there's others who listen like six months later. And that's all well and good. But for the ones who want it now, like it's cool. We add the Overcast ping. Well, there's an issue there because... Overcast pings, but we're caching our feeds for a few minutes. Maybe it's just a minute. And so Overcast says there's a new episode. And so you click on it and you go there and there isn't a new episode. And then you refresh. It's not there. Then you refresh. It's not there. Then you refresh and it is there. And it was like 60 seconds Mm -hmm. because we're caching. Yeah. So I just turned that ping off and thought, well, people can just wait for Overcast to crawl us again for now. But I would love to solve that problem. And so then I started thinking, you know, we already have a place where we store data that's a single instance, but is a service, so to speak, and it's called Postgres. And instead of adding like a memcache D or a Redis or figuring out these uh, caching issues inside of the Erlang system, which was not trivial in my research, I was like, what if we just pre-compute and, and throw stuff into Postgres? And I did a test run of that, the feeds, just the feeds. And just turn off all other caching because I don't think we actually need any other caching. It's just like I already had caching set up, so I cached a few popular pages. But what if I just did it on the feeds? And every time you publish, you just blow it away, rerun it, and put it in Postgres. And you just serve it as static content out of Postgres. I did some initial testing on that locally. And it's like consistently 50 millisecond responses at with like Apache Bench. Like it was not a problem. Mm-hmm. It's never super fast, like it's like you get with Erlang, where it's like it's, it's like microseconds, which I always like to see those stats. But that's not what we need, right? Like consistently, fifty milliseconds is like great. Yeah. Without any caching layer, I mean, you're basically just pulling it out of Postgres and serving it. Mm-hmm. Very few code changes. It just it just felt like okay, this is kind of a silly idea using Postgres as a cache effectively. But like, what if it just works and it's simple, and we don't have to add any infrastructure? So I, I want to test that sort of in production. Like I kind of want to roll it out and run it and then easily roll it back if it's not going to actually work in production. But I don't really have the metrics. I don't have the observability. Yep. I have Fastly observability through Honeycomb, but I'm lacking the app responses mm-hmm. observability, which is really what we want. We don't want Fastly to be waiting on the app all of a sudden and the app to be you know just bogged down on other requests. And so that's where I came back to you and said, this is what I would like to see is, can we get Elixir talking or can we get Phoenix talking to Honeycomb in some sort of native fashion? And then I found this open telemetry thing and I stopped right there. So I will let you respond after that long monologue. No, no. I mean, that that's exactly it. I mean, we knew we wanted to, to do that. It's like another experiment, which I wanted to continue with. And I'm so keen to get back to it to see how that integration could work. That was like on my list for as long as I can remember. And I'm so excited to be finally doing it. We're finally in a good place to do that integration. And uh, I'm very confident that we'll be able to talk about it at the next Kaizen, in the next Kaizen. <laughs> oh, we said it. Yeah, <laughs> the next go. Kaizen. <laughs> in the next Kaizen. Gosh. Okay, so we have it on record. There will be another Kaizen. Oh, yes. It's not just a hope and a dream. We just need to figure out where. Right. So if I understand this correctly, Jared, you, you've done this work, but you haven't done it in production. So you need a way to test in production, essentially, to see how it re- responds. I, I spiked it out on a branch, and then it was just like, okay, this is certainly feasible. And then I, I, benched, I did some you know, rudimentary benchmarking of that branch just to make sure it's not crazy dumb. 
And then I'm like, okay, this will, this is feasible. And I know how to bring this into like official code. Like I can definitely transition what I coded into like, or even just rewrite it in a way that's maintainable if we decide to do it. But I really like to know if it's going to be really dumb or just kind of dumb. You know, like Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just dumb enough that it just might work, you know, and be so simple and solve a problem in a way that's just like awesomely dumb. But I don't want it to be so dumb that it's not going to (laughs) work. That's that's the real spirit of shipping. Yeah. Right. We literally have to get it out to see if it works, like what happens. And then I was like, well, what I lack is metrics. Mm. If I can observe it for a few hours, get some confidence, leave it in or be like, oh, cow, that was not it worked great in dev, but it's not going to work with a real load. You know, I have I have a question for Adam. So, Adam, Mm -hmm. I think this may be the moment to set to tell us again about the benefits of feature flags. I almost mentioned it there. I was like, I don't want to have egg on my face by mentioning feature flags. I know Jared's sort of been a resistant to some degree against it, but there may be a simpler way to do this. But I think that that's essentially what you want to do. You want to test this in production on a limited set of users. So it could be scoped to admins only, for example. No, because I want to load test it. I want to, I want the, the full load is, is my issue. But could be like maybe 50% of the requests you can compare them. So yeah. 50% of the requests, 50-50. A threshold. Going to the old one, 50 to the to the new implementation and see how do they compare over the course of maybe a few days. Yeah, we can do that. So Adam, how do we get feature flags? What do you think? Mm. Where do you stand on that? Well, if we're doing 50-50, can't we just do like an if statement with like yeah. random divided by two? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. If it's an even well. second, <laughs> do this. And if it's an uneven second, do the other thing. <laughs> if it's a imperial unit or if it's the, sure. the, uh, the metric system. Is this the metric <laughs> system or which system we're going to use here? Luckily, seconds only exist <laughs> in one. <laughs> I know Adam's been keen on feature flags. I feel like this is his big moment to introduce some sort of subsystem. I think so too. I mean, I don't feel like I have a system to the pitch here. <laughs> no, I remember the conversation, Jared. That's why I keep going back to it. <laughs> because we didn't have a good answer for, for, for Adam and we were both against it. So maybe now it's coming back and maybe now it's a yes. Because it was a no, definite no back then. We were premature. When I try to pitch... Feature flags. The the insider story here, listeners, is there There was... My initial pitch for us using feature flags was fell on deaf ears essentially because we were premature. We just didn't have the needs for it. We're trying to find a use for it. And if you follow Kaizen and ship it and what we've done, then you know our application is pretty simple. We don't have a lot of developers developing on it. So there's not a real need for, you know, an immense feature flags, feature and or service to use. Mm -hmm. Launch Dark was our friends for a while there. Uh, I'd still say they're friendly, but they're not friends. We're not working with them directly anymore. We do have a new sponsor coming on board, DevCycle, which is in the feature fly business. Which, you know, if you wanted to use it for this one instance, I'm sure we could do something. So, I mean, there is an opportunity there, but that would be my pitch. I feel like, you know, if it's just this one off, though, then the if statement probably works. Well, I'll let you know when I get, when I get <laughs> yeah. this far. We, what, we, what, what we need first is, the, I think, is the observability. Uh, and because we're either way, if we do it 50 50, we want to see both results. Course. And so right now I don't really, I can't see any results besides sit there and stare at the log files and look at the request responses, which was a side effect actually of one of our recent changes. Our log files just stopped logging. I got it fixed, but that was funny. So I'm like, wait a second, there aren't any logs. How can the change log not log? Right. It's mean, just like against the laws of nature, essentially. Well, I'm mm-hmm. not going to get blame that one <laughs> on the air because I don't want to embarrass Gerhard, but... <laughs> I fixed that, it. That's okay. I can't get embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> because I'm going to learn something new out of this. There you go. So tell me the commit where this was introduced so that I can understand my mistake. Seriously. So the f- the code that fixes it is in commit F19C9CF, where I basically change the application file to basically turn the logger back on. So you were just, I think you were overly aggressive when you were, you were removing a few things. We removed Promax because we're not really using Grafana anymore. Mm -hmm. And you just deleted too much code. Mm -hmm. And the code that you deleted would, if we're not in IEX, turn on the default logger, but you deleted it. So there was no default logger. And so it wouldn't log anything in prod at all. 
I see. And you didn't notice. Yeah, that's right. And I didn't notice until I thought, well, I'll just go see what's going on in production. And there's like, there was no logs there. So I actually just put that code back in that you had deleted is all. Right. So, so hang on, let me try and understand this code. That's what's happening right now. I'm trying to understand some lister code live as we are recording this. I'm looking at the application EX line 32, unless code ensure loaded and IEX started do. Which of those two lines disables logging? The 33 or the 35 one? Oban telemetry attached default logger? No, that's not the no. line. Look at endpoint.ex line 60. Plug, plug.telemetry. That's the line. Okay, okay. Where okay. you basically remove the telemetry plug. I see. So the telemetry plug logs? Yes. I see. Okay. The logger uses the telemetry plug. Right, right, right. To do its thing. Now, if it, were, it would have been plug log. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I would have made that mistake. Right, yeah. But yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. So yeah, it was an easy mistake to make. And I know how it is when you're removing stuff. You're like, oh, this we don't need, this we don't need. And I think it was just that one line. That's it. Just turn that off. And we didn't notice because we weren't really looking at production. Now, had we been sending it over to Honeycomb and observing it, we probably would have seen the drop off immediately because telemetry would have been turned off there. Yeah, that's right. So I think the Honeycomb integration will use this open telemetry plug as well when we do it. So that was the line that did it. It wasn't the other one. There was a few other things that you also removed. I put them back in, but that was like Oban stuff. Mm -hmm. Not a big deal. Okay. Uh, it was just, you know, over aggressive deletion, which is totally normal when we're like, right. let's. Yeah, I deleted too much. Yeah. When you're in like, let's delete stuff mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know how it is because it feels so good. Okay. 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 So there you go. Cool. That's good to know. So who reviewed my PR? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Do you see where this is going? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> cool great well it wasn't me clearly <laughs> i know <laughs> i merged it but i didn't review I think it i waited for a while i said you know what i'm just gonna push this through <laughs> because that's how we roll <laughs> there you go no that's fine that's fine no even if i reviewed it i must have not reviewed it very yeah. well so <laughs> you know that's okay <laughs> Yeah, it was an honest mistake. Well, yeah, totally. <laughs> On both our parts. <laughs> On both our parts. Let me chase that rabbit down. I got a question for you. So once we put this experiment into production here, what's going to happen? Can you come back to the beginning where if we get this potentially smart yes. Postgres feature out there, let's say it's successful. Yes. What happens? What happens as a result of that being successful? So what happens is every single request that goes to one of our feeds will be served live from Postgres, from what I call like a feeds cache inside our Postgres instance. So it's effectively, it's as if it was reading off disk, but we don't have disk because we're in fly land, but it's just on disk inside of Postgres. Mm -hmm. And so it goes out of Postgres, goes out live. So every request is immediate. And then every time that we change something that's gonna change the feeds, Mm -hmm. We blow that one away and we rewrite it. So we recompute the feed. It's basically a, a cache inside of Postgres because mm. that's already our single source of data, right? Whereas if we did it anywhere else, we'd have to have a shared data source, uh, et cetera. I think what's more important is that this enables us to run more than one instance of changelog. Exactly. Right now, because of how caching is done, we can only have one instance of changelog. And we have been on this journey for quite some time now, right? If you remember, we had a persistent disk. So we did have local disk. But when we had that, it meant that we could only get have a single instance because all our media assets were stored on that one disk. So we pushed the media assets to S3, and now we could have more than one. But then the next thing was like, oh, damn it, the caching. So once we solved the caching... We can run more than one instance. We can spread them across the world. We can serve dynamic requests from where users are rather than everything going through the CDN and CDN really only caches the static stuff. And even then it has to time out. That's why we have also like the, the time, right? Because CDN also caches for about 60 seconds. Right. Yeah. The other thing that lets us do is serve different feeds to different requesters. And so here's why this might be interesting. So Spotify specifically supports, well, allegedly, I haven't seen it working very much. They support chapters. If you put them as text in your show notes using the YouTube style timestamps thing. So I just put it in for everybody at this point, but it's silly to put it into the show notes for listeners who have regular podcast apps that 
support chapters the way that you should, not because they're Spotify. Well, we could just serve from using this system. We could have two different versions of the feed, both put into Postgres, use the request header to identify Spotify because it has a standard request and serve a slightly different feed to Spotify than we serve to everybody else and give them those timestamps. And so you get the chapters over there, but you don't clutter up your feeds for everybody else. And you can't do that very well with caching because it's like, well, we got a cache version, right? And the, the requests never hit our server. They're just Fastly. And maybe you could put that logic inside of Fastly, but now you have to point it at two different places and manage that whole deal. And so this also enables that where you can basically have N caches per request and serve the right one dynamically, but still have it pre-computed. So it's kind of a best of both worlds. By the way, to our listener, I realize this is kind of a dumb way of doing it. If it's super dumb and you have reasons why, please tell me because I'm about to roll it out. <laughs> I'm about to roll it out. I don't think it is. Why is it dumb? Why do you keep saying this? Why do you think it's dumb? What's the logic behind it being dumb? Storing pre-computed text inside of Postgres. That's somewhat large. Like I, I read some, like how big is it? Is it too big? And it's like 2.3 megabytes in a Postgres record. Seems like it's fine, actually. But once you start getting up to like 100 megabytes, now you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We're not going to make it there with any of our documents. But maybe even at 2.3 megabytes at scale, it's just going to read too slow. Or I don't know. It seems like a very low tech, mm -hmm. kind of silly way of doing it. And so maybe it's just lack of confidence is why I think it sounds dumb. I, th I think this is a step in the right direction because Fly brings the app closer to the users. Right. And Fly really makes it less necessary to run a CDN or maybe completely unnecessary depending on the case. If we want to depend less on the CDN, which I think is a good idea, and if we distribute the app, our apps around the world, that means that we can rely less on the CDN, which by the way, had like all sorts of, of, of issues which we are yet to solve and serve directly from our app so basically, we are reverting back, putting changelog.com behind the CDN. And we had to do that because we had a single instance. We had like all sorts of issues related to that. But now if we have multiple instances, one per continent, um, again, depending on where our users are, we no longer need to depend on the CDN as much as we did before. And by the way, Fly itself, it has a proxy. It has a global proxy, which means that depending on where you are, those edge instances, they will connect to the app instance, which is closest to the edge. So then we are pulling more of that stuff in our app, which makes us be able to code more things, as Jared mentions, pull more of that smarts in code rather than in CDN configuration or other things, which are very difficult to understand, very difficult to troubleshoot. I mean, we've had so many <laughs> hair pulling moments. That's why we have so, so, so little hair, right? In a few <laughs> sections, like going like, why the hell, how this, uh, yeah, like how this is varnish even work because it doesn't make any sense. Right. And we built our own little version control inside of Fastly between Gerhard and I by adding a comment and putting whose name it is at last edited it, which we would love to just have, you know, our actual programming tooling. Seems smart. I mean, I think... If we can get, I mean, if it takes us to where we're going to go, I agree with you 100% that having our app be its own CDN, so to speak, closer to all the users, which is what Fastly is giving us at the app level, then it can be dynamic in ways that is, is possible with Fastly, but it's just cumbersome to this day. Yeah. And I guess one more layer here is we haven't truly embodied the vision of Fly, which is our app closer users because of this cache issues. This is full circle. The whole reason for this cache right. experiment was to be able to bring to fruition that actual dream with no ops or you know very, very little ops. But we haven't been able to do that because of this cache layer. Well, our app does run close to our users in the greater Houston area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually in Virginia. <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> Virginia. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, shows what I know. It's um, IAD. The IED data center, yeah. Yeah. Well, all that to say, like, you know, getting to this direction is is challenging. I think uh, the logic in this Postgres sounds sounds fine. I mean, if we were, like you had said, above a larger threshold, you know, a couple megs, not that big of a deal. 
And if the app's close to the user and there's one, uh, I'm assuming there's probably like one or two primary Postgres writes and then the rest are reads, right? That's how it would set up naturally with Postgres on fly. Yeah, the writes would actually happen on publish. Uh, the the writes happen on edit, not on first request, which is what happens now with a typical caching. Is like first request, we calculate it once. Now we're not going to calculate it again for sixty seconds. Then we'll calculate it once. Mm. This is actually on write. Is when we're doing the compute, which we've wanted to move to. The other option is to put this on a static file server like S three, and then you know manage and blow away different files. But then I started thinking like we actually like our URLs how they are. And so then our app would be reading from S3 and responding as a proxy. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's already proxy to Postgres. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we would cache on write versus on read, which makes us have immediate changes. There's no 60 second delay or five minutes or whatever you send it to. And I'm in that camp. I mean, I listened to our show immediately as soon as we ship, you know, the change log at least. I mean... As a, just a crazy person, like whenever you shift something, you want to make sure it's in production. The only way you get to do it is like to test it. Uh, and the app I use is Overcast primarily. I don't think I have notifications on because I just hate notifications just generally as sure. If I don't have to have notifications on for an application, they're off for sure. But when I do go there, I usually test it on the master feed directly because I listen to master like you should be. Hey, listen, if you're not listening on master, you're wrong <laughs> or plus plus and you'd be even better. Right. Because it's better. But I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a master feed subscriber in that regard, and I'm pulled to refresh, and it does take a bit for the new episodes to get there, for me at least. So I'm not like a ship it, and a 30 seconds, a minute later, it's in overcast. Like It takes longer than I've counted, let's just say. I haven't actually sat there and counted. I'm just like, oh, it's not there. I'll come back later. I come back, and it's there. The one thing about this, which gets me really excited, is that we will double down on PostgreSQL. So we talked about this for a while. Crunch date is what I'm thinking, but it's not the only way. In what regard are you thinking crunchy data? I'm thinking a PostgreSQL as a service that scales really, really well. So then the app is all fly. PostgreSQL is managed via crunch data. We have a global presence, nicely replicated, all that nice stuff. And then we consume PostgreSQL as a service at a global scale. Our app runs at a global scale on fly and the database the same, but with someone else. Because the PostgreSQL in Fly, it's not a managed one. It's easy, convenient, we have a lot of advantages, and it's been holding up really well since we set it up, no issues. But we can, I mean, if the app is distributed, and if the app gets this level of, of attention, I think so should our database. Because now these are the two important pieces. We scale the app, we should scale the database. I mean. If, for example, we have all these app instances that connect to the same PostgreSQL instance back in the US, that's not going to be any good, right? Reading all those megabytes across continents, that's going to be slow. Hmm. Isn't that the point, though, for like the read servers that are distributed? So we could, yeah, we could add multiple PostgreSQL read replicas in Fly. We could do that. Right. Um, maybe tune them. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe try and understand better what they do, but maybe... Rather than doing that, we can grow up our approach to databases and go with someone that does this as a service. I know Planet Scale comes up as well. There's like a couple of we can use PostgreSQL as a service. But that's my SQL. Planet Scale. There's one which I know it's PostgreSQL. Maybe it's not Planet Scale. Uh, what was it? Superbase? I, th I think it's Superbase. I, th I think it's Superbase. I think that's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. See, not enough time to experiment. <laughs> there is a conversation, let's just say. There's a conversation. So we may be meeting in the middle, let's just say. Don't want to give too much away. Exactly. But dreams, we are dreaming together. Exactly. And we need to experiment a lot. So that's the whole point, right? We need to try a couple of things out, see what makes sense. I know Jared loves his PostgreSQL, the vanilla one, the open source one. I do. You know, as unaltered as they come. Mm. And he... So good. We're actually coming out with a t-shirt, Gerhard. It says Postgres compatible is not Postgres. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. No, not really. <laughs> okay. We want to. <laughs> is that the Jared tagline? <laughs> no, that's actually a, a Craig Kirstein's cat tagline. Right. I do like uh, just Postgres as a t-shirt. Just Postgres, yeah. yeah? Just Postgres. 
we will be doubling down on that. That's what matters. And we'll be okay, proving right. that part as well. You know, like all this is leading us into that direction. And that's really exciting. So I wrote this right here. I was, I was writing it right there. There you go. On a napkin. It's a thing. Okay. <laughs> now we have a plan. That's how old dreams start. On a napkin. <laughs> mm, I've been doodling while we're, while we're having this call. Put some bees and some dollars as well while you're at it. Yeah, put some dollars on there. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> step one, Postgres. Step two, question mark. Step three, profit. Yeah, or Postgres. Change the S into dollars. That'll be good. That's right. I'll do that. Yes. <laughs> it's already there. <laughs> That's our business plan. We're going to turn Postgres into dollars. Well, let's say somebody's listening this far and they're thinking, man, this really sucks. Okay. What sucks? I'm here at the end of this amazing episode. Well, I'm going <laughs> to tell you what sucks. I'm going to tell you. They're going to be like, you know, I liked this show. Come on, guys. What's going on here? Mm-hmm. Can we can we dream a little bit to where this might go, the, the next version of Kaizen? Can we give them some prescription versus just wait and see? Jared, you mentioned subscribing to the change law, which I think is a great, you know, a great, you know, next step after this. Well, I think it makes sense to do our next Kaizen on the change log if we don't have anywhere else to do it. That's right. Yeah. Which is probably likely. <laughs> right? I mean we could cross post it to the ship it feed, I guess. Yeah. Or Why not? Episode 91 will be Kaizen in 10 <laughs> <Just> months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so will 92. It's also possible. <laughs> yeah. And so will 92. Yeah. Oh. Or we go straight to 100 and then people are like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. Where's all the rest? <laughs> right. So it'll be 90, 100. We'll be just going 10 to 10. We were just talking about Fahrenheit yeah. and Celsius. You know, we just. <laughs> yeah. It's not a Gosh, Don't go there. <laughs> That's more of a Celsius thing. That's a. Uh, 100 is hot. Um. I would say we would publish our next Kaizen on the changelog feed. Mm -hmm. Isn't that safe? That's probably the safest bet today. I think so. It is what makes most sense to me too. And stay tuned for more from that. I mean, we'll we'll have more to say on that episode. Mm -hmm. Well, I I have one thing which I really have to say. Okay. And I have to mention this because I've been trying to get to someone from 1Password since January 15th when I sent my email. And I haven't heard back. Mm. So if someone knows someone within one password that can help with their services account, this is so that we can use secrets from one password without needing to run the connect server. I mean, we will set up a connect server if we need to, but hopefully we'll be able to access the secrets using this new beta feature, which as far as I'm aware, it's called services accounts that allows us to use the secrets programmatically in CI systems. Right now, we can't do that without the Connect server. And ideally, I would like to use the Go SDK, and you see where I'm going with this, which is directly in code so that our CI will never see the secrets. It's just a code that connects to the one con- one password instance, and it pulls it just in time as the code runs. So if anyone knows someone, uh, I would very much like to talk to them to get this feature, try this beta feature, see how it works. Alternatively, how do you feel about a migration from one password? <laughs> <laughs> oh, negative. Rotating secrets is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> yes, I mean, we want something that works and works well. Yeah. So we can set up a connect server. I mean, it's, it's so easy to set up anything up on fly these days. So maybe we'll just do that. Yeah. Uh, which will act as a gateway to one password. Well, we can make something happen with one password. There is some opportunity there. Mm-hmm. So, great. That's the one thing which I'm, which was on 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 my list. Let me go to work. You know, excellent. I'm a big fan of one password. I like it too, very much. And I root for them in all ways. I've been using them for more than a decade. I mean, like just basically forever. They're embedded in my operations, and now with SSH integrations and stuff like that. Like I just love biometrically. And thank you for removing all of our SSH needs. Mm-hmm. change all the com infrastructure wise but you know i still have lane infrastructure that i have to log into and biometrically logging in via ssh is just it's the way to go yeah for sure yeah and uh, i was reading this blog post on the one password blog about uh, passwordless systems i'm just going to double check the title so the blog post is pass keys in one password the future of passwordless and it was published on november 17th 2022 so not that long ago and it was mentioned a couple more times. So I think that's a really cool idea. So I really like where 1Password is and where they're going. Uh, if we can only figure this this thing out, it'll be even more amazing for us. Yeah. So no more secrets in GitHub. Yes, baby. <laughs> that's what I want. Cool. 
All right. Well, should we call it a, a pod? I think we should call it a pod. Someone needs to sing something. I feel like it. It's my birthday tomorrow. So Jared sings <laughs> that. Happy trails to you. See, told you. That's all you're getting. Until we meet again. But he tried to sing uh, Semi Sonic on that sh- on the Closing the Time and Friends episode we did. Yeah, he, he started singing Closing Time. I added you right out of that, man. I didn't want you embarrassed. Ah. He did not get to do a good job. <laughs> All I said was, uh, you don't have to go home much. You can't stay here. Well, that's what happened in 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 uh, the one that shipped. Ah, behind the scenes, it was worse. I'm just messing with Jared. I'm just being I'm just being silly. I don't even believe you. With all this time that I'm going to have from not shipping uh, a ship it episode every week, do you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to go Dan Tan. Ah. Dan. <laughs> that's what's happening <laughs> Dan Tan comes again every week I'll go Dan Tan <laughs> Dan Tan so that's what's up oh my gosh love it I got my kids saying Dan Tan now there you go never telling that story again everyone is on it everyone's saying it <laughs> so that's my plan alright sounds good Gerhard alright thank you it has been good thank you always a pleasure there will be a next one two and a half months away Right? Roughly. So I don't know exactly when, but two and a half months away. It will be warm and nice where you are, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Kaizen. Same. Kaizen. Kaizen. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Shibit. Check out our other podcasts for developers at changelog.com slash faster. You can connect with like-minded developers via changelog.com slash community. Thank you all for being a great audience. I really enjoyed making all this content for you. Thank you to all the guests that have joined me on ShipIt.show. I had such a great time with you all. Until next time.